Today, again, as I mentioned, we're going through the book of Joshua and uh, where we've been. So uh, we've had three more weeks of our, of our study and worship series, but uh, we were last in Joshua in chapter 21, and there was a summary of all that had happened in God leading the people of Israel into the promised land. So they'd made it. They had arrived. And everything came to pass, and the enemies were defeated, as God had told them would happen. And in these last three chapters we're going to focus on, 22, 23, and 24, uh, we read of specific isolated incidences among the people of God. And I think if the God has a, has a whole chapter devoted to some of these specific incidences, it might be good for us to listen and pay attention to. <laughs> Um, and turns more from the emphasis of the faithfulness of God to the people to are the, are the people going to be faithful to God and to one another? And uh, just a reminder of how fragile relationships between people can be. Amen? And uh, conflict, right? Does anybody like conflict? No. And I think if you're saying, yeah, I like to get into conflict with others, I, really? <laughs> No, uh, most of us, if anyone's like me, we pretty much try to avoid it as much as possible. And I, I got an interesting answer from, from Kelly. Uh, what do you think is the best way to resolve a conflict? Uh, how good are you at doing this? And she said, I try to avoid conflict and do not like conflict <laughs> at all. But when it occurs, I find the best way to deal with it is to first pray about it. And then the best way I've dealt with conflict was to write that person a letter of my feelings and then have a phone call with that person to solve it. I've solved some conflicts that way. It's worked great. So anyway, that was a thoughtful response. Um, I don't know. Any others? Just responses to that? Yeah. Jane? Listen. Listen. Okay. What's that? You got two ears and one mouth, right? <laughs> okay. And I'm not very good at it. Okay. Thank you for the honesty. <laughs> John. Interesting. So, do something together. Some kind of, that, that helps the conflict. Competition helps. Okay. That's a unique way of putting it. Compete, do a board game, play tennis. Destroy that other person you're having. No. Okay. Sorry, I've, I've taken it out of context. Okay, <laughs> Linda. Find common ground. But yeah, try to... Ian? Just uh, being aware of my body, what is happening, how do I feel all through, and, okay. at, you know, step back. Okay, so aware when it's happening, aware. how am I reacting, taking note, okay. Yeah, do I need to, my, mouth dry, tears, okay. And good signs, I need to maybe just step away even, take a breath, okay. Well, I, didn't, I just wanted us to start thinking of this because, um, again, we've seen in this book God's faithfulness towards his people. That question again, will God's people continue to be faithful to him? And, um, and we see this instance of, of uh, what's happening among the people. Um, if you go back to the, the book of Numbers, I know you're in that book a lot, right? Daily, the book of Numbers. Um, well, when the people got to the edge of the Jordan, they sent the spies out, and they were ready to finally take over the land. And while they're there, the, these two and a half tribes, Reuben, Gad, and half of the tribe of Manasseh, had asked Joshua, you know, Joshua, we like it here. We'd like to stay here and not cross that big Jordan River the, that they had to cross to get into the land that God had eventually promised them. And, and it, it's kind of like when people were settling in the United States, uh, some stayed in New Jersey. And it's like, yeah, we just like it here. We don't want to go any further. It's like... New Jersey? He didn't want to go to Oregon? <laughs> but I just joke about this, but it's almost like they, they were okay with staying here on this one side of the Jordan, and it was okay. Moses said to them, okay, you can, you're still, though, going to have to cross over and help the others, help the other tribes conquer the land that God had promised them. You're still going to need to go, but then you can go back and settle on the eastern side. 
So Joshua was about to move and reminded them they also needed to help, and then they could go back, and they agreed. They said, all that you have said, we will do. So, okay, we're going to eventually settle in this land, but we will participate with everyone in moving into the land and taking the land that God had led us. So it's about seven years later, here are these same two and a half tribes. These soldiers had been away from their families and land for like seven years, and it's time to go home. And Joshua says, you've been faithful to God and to me. You've done everything I've asked. Now that your brothers have rest in the land, you too will have rest. Uh, Back to the other side of the Jordan. So they had completed that. And that's where I'd like Robin to come up and give us the Bible reading for today. She's going to read an Old Testament passage as well as a New Testament passage that relates to our uh, theme today. So thank you, Robin, for reading God's Word. Good morning. Today's Bible readings are from Joshua 22 and Colossians 3. From Joshua 22, verses 1 through 6. Then Joshua summoned the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, and said to them, You have done all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded, and you have obeyed me in everything I commanded. For a long time now, to this very day, you have not deserted your brothers, but have carried out the mission the Lord your God gave you. Now that the Lord your God has given your brothers rest as he promised, return to your homes in the land that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of the Jordan. But be very careful to keep the commandment and the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to obey his commands, and to hold fast to him and serve him with all your heart and all your soul. Then Joshua blessed them and sent them away, and they went to their homes. And from Colossians 3, verses 12 through 17, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and peace. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts toward God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Robin. Good to see all of God's word uh, so relevant, whether we're looking at the Old Testament or New Testament, how they are woven together. As we uh, just read in Joshua, again, as, they, as the people from the eastern tribes returned home, these tribes were admonished by Joshua to keep the faith and not to wander after other gods. That's a summary of what he shared with what, what Robin just read, and, and really the same for us today. Uh, Joshua gives him a warning, be careful to observe the commands, cling to these words with all your heart and soul, and so it's a, it's a gentle warning or admonishment, uh, not to go to the other, you know, to where things will be bad for you if you go off of this path. And it's kind of like, uh, I know several of us have kids in, in college right now, and, and uh, when you drop them off at school or send them off in a plane, you kind of... You know, in some ways, you sometimes say, you know, be careful, <laughs> I love you. And in other words, in some ways, even don't get in trouble. <laughs> but, um, you know, we always want to give them some kind of parental word of, you know, encouragement or to stay on the right path, right? Um, and uh, maybe then, even when you have younger kids, you drop them off at a babysitter or a babysitter comes over to your house or whatever, and you tell them, you know, don't do anything bad, <laughs> be good, <laughs> you know, right? We want them to... Stay an observing of the parents' desires and, and what's right to do. But um, in, a, in a way, Joshua, as leader, he is taking the role that he's called to do to admonish these tribes, warning, instructing them 
to uh, turn from sin, walk towards God and his word. And uh, uh, this is just, I think, a real strong and emotional moment as these tribes are going to be on now the other side of the Jordan than the others, than the other tribes. But uh, he's, he's warning them, pleading with them, don't wander. And keep your focus on, on the Lord and worshiping him. And uh, one other passage from Colossians uh, that wasn't read, but it's from Colossians 1.28 uh, Paul writes, it says, we proclaim him, we proclaim Jesus, admonishing, teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. So that role of admonishing, um, uh, not only as pastor, but each, uh, each one of us as believers to uh, remain, encourage one another, to remain faithful. Uh, it isn't like a sometimes you think admonish means like reprimanding. Like I'm saying to Pastor Louie, I reprimand, you know, I've got a word to pick with Noah. I'm admonishing him. I'm encouraging him today. Pastor Louie, stay firm in the gospel as you have had all the years of your life and ministry, right? Encouraging him. You can do it, right, Pastor Louie? Till that day that the Lord calls us home. That's our goal, right? Each one of us, that we would remain faithful. And, and that's our calling. Uh, keep the faith. Don't lose heart. And so that verse that Robin did read from Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, as we're doing today. Sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. So that's, that's our call as a follower of Christ, uh, to do this, to admonish. And it's challenging. It requires a relationship first, doesn't it? I have to have a relationship if I'm going to be in that kind of role with somebody. Uh, trust, courage, um, and uh, giving admonishment, um, uh, and it's, you know, it implies, again, a relationship. And it might even mean sometimes I just want to give you a little bit of a warning here. Um, maybe uh, uh, someone, a friend, gets into a new relationship, and you, know, you just kind of be careful, right? Be careful. Don't give yourself away. Or, or somebody starts their dream job, and it's like something they've earned and worked for all their life, and, and it's like, well, just reminding you, don't make this dream job your God, you know, be faithful to the Lord. Don't make that bigger than God in your life. But there's a problem in our day and era that we're in with admonishment. Let's admit this. Because we live in a day and age where we want the benefits of community without the cost. Hmm. Think about this. And are you willing to receive the truth? Are you willing to speak truth into another person's life? Uh, a lot of times in our culture today, People would say that no one else has the right to speak into my life, right? Just no one has the right to give me some kind of wisdom or even correction. Just affirm me in everything I do. I'm just my own island. I do what I want to do. And that's not community. Uh, just a really false facade. And so if, uh, if you, you know, some believe admonishment, none of my business, but if we're in the family of Christ, a true godly community, if we're committed to one another, yeah, we have to continue to speak and encourage and speak truth into one another's lives. Um, okay, many of us are parents, not all of us, but if you're a parent, it's, um, your child's business is your business, <laughs> or they end up on the news somewhere in a bad report, okay? I mean, you know, as, as children are in our care and as a, as in, our, as a, in our household, yeah, we, we need to do that. Not like, oh, well, just do whatever you want and hope you come home safe or whatever. Yeah, we, need, we have that role. So a pretty, and Scripture says even more so in the body of Christ. There, there's often in the body of Christ, uh, in, through faith, a stronger connection than sometimes in immediate families, right? That faith in Christ that binds us in, together. So speaking into another's life, listening to others speak into our lives, and uh, again, it's hard sometimes. We don't like to necessarily confront others, but true Christian community may say hard things for another's good. And so, okay, what keeps us from practicing this kind of admonition, uh, from being afraid sometimes even when in a loving way to confront? So if we go back to Joshua, um, we're going to, I'm going to skip down to about verse 11, 10 through 12 actually. And drama begins as the other tribes heard that the eastern tribes had built the altar on the border of Canaan. Okay, so just in real quick summary, uh, and I'll read a couple of these verses. Uh, verse 10, 22, 10. When they came to Galeoth near Jordan in the land of Canaan, the Reubenites, Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, those two and a half tribes, right, went back to the east side, uh, they built an imposing 
uh, altar there by the Jordan. And when the Israelites heard that they had built the altar on the border at Canaan at Gelioth near the Jordan on the Israelite side, the whole assembly of Israel gathered at Shiloh to go to war against them. Okay, so we're going to stop here for a second here. Phineas, we're going to read about him. He was worried. It says, when Israelites sent Phineas, son of Eleazar the priest, to the land of Gilead, to the, these tribes, and sent a whole contingent. And basically, I'll explain more about this. He was worried. He didn't want another situation like Peor in Numbers 25. Okay, and I'll explain more, but the key thing here, assumptions get us into trouble. Amen? Ever assume something that maybe wasn't exactly right? That's going to cause some trouble. And uh, in that verse seven, in verse 17... As he's talking, as, as they're gathering him, all these men that he brought with them uh, to wage war, um, it says in verse 17, uh, was not the sin, he's, as he's confronting these two and a half tribes, was not the sin of Peor enough for us? And, I'll, you know, again, Phineas kind of like jumping the gun here. And as we think about assumptions, getting us into trouble, because the, the two and a half tribes had gone to the edge of the river and they built an altar this imposing giant stone altar. Okay, so, okay, what is this? Um, And I want you to think about, this was huge. What's the biggest monument you've ever been to or seen? Anybody seen, anybody been to Mount Rushmore? That's a pretty big one. Um, Eiffel Tower? Mm, (laughs) We? Any other, just shout out. What's another monument you've been to? Big, crazy horse. Same same area there by Mount Rushmore, yeah. How about this next one? Can you tell me where that is? Is Greg Lundin there? Greg, you've seen that. You've been there, right? When you traveled in uh, Rio? Yeah. Cristo Redentor, is that the name of it? Or Yeah. So think about any imposing structure. And they made an imposing structure here. Um, and they built, it's named an altar. Okay, why? Well, I'm going to talk about that later. I'll keep you in suspense here. But the other tribes catch wind of this, of their building an altar. And I don't know if they saw it on Instagram or on Facebook, right? That somehow they got word, right? Um, and a potential problem, because in the book of Deuteronomy, there were instructions. There would only be one altar for the people of Israel. Pagans had lots of altars, many gods. But God said, no, there's only one altar by which you may worship. And it was so another altar, a potential problem. But it, all it says in verse 11 is, the Israelites heard that they, I, almost like gossip, people are talking, people are talking about this big monument altar thing you built. And because of this, they're ready to kill. They're ready to go to war to destroy these two and a half tribes for what they assumed was building an altar that was gonna, where they were going to be sacrificing. Uh, and ju- so they're jumping to conclusions Think about the seven years that these tribes had just been brother to brother, arm in arm, working together to take the land that God had promised them, right? They had given up, left their families. They had, we'll do whatever Joshua tells us. Yes, the Lord is, and so the other tribes though, they they confront them with suspicion. They don't do it gently. They just say, what is this breach of faith? We're ready to destroy you. And they aren't just wanting to talk, okay? Uh, there's Phineas, you, you heard me speak of, he was the son of Eleazar. Phineas was a very zealous man, had a passion for God, good character qualities, but maybe a little too amped and just ready to fight. Um, he refers to this, remember what happened at Peor, and that's where there was a significant problem where God's people were intermingling with those they shouldn't have, other just Pagan people that were worshiping other gods. They broke faith with God. A plague came across the people. And Phineas took matters into his own hands. And you can read more about the grisly details, but he ended the plague by destroying some people that were acting wrongly. Okay, to put it mildly. But he just assumes this is the same situation. So we need to, it's like, ready, fire, aim. Okay? Wrong sequence, right? Um, and, you know, i got to admit, some people are just ready, ready, well, not ready, meaning they don't 
use that admonishment or that right way of coming to people. Other, you know, we were like hesitant. Uh, not yet, not yet. Others are the exact opposite. And it's, it's just fire, fire, fire. They're ready to go after anyone at any time for any reason. So one question you could ask, are you somebody who is more bent towards confrontation or someone who is bent more towards avoidance of conflict? How are you in that scheme of things? And ultimately, each one of us, as we talked about with the kids, what do we need to do? We need to follow the example of Jesus. And in Matthew 18, many of you have heard this referred to as the Matthew 18 principle. We see in Matthew 18, 15. Let's go ahead and read this together, this verse. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. From Matthew 18, 15. And that's the goal. Restoration, back to the Lord. And it, just before this passage in Matthew, it's always interesting to look at the context because before this passage, Jesus is talking about sheep that have gone astray. And searching after even that of the hundred sheep, the one that is missing. That's what the goal is. That's what God's goal is. That's what Jesus wants. You know, gentleness, kindness, Christ-like compassion, and, and talking with others in humility. And, and uh, as we go back to uh, the passage, and I'm, I'm skipping down now, and I encourage you to read this chapter in completeness on your own. Uh, time just doesn't allow us to read all these verses right now, but in verse 21 and following, we think, well, okay, what are these eastern tribes going to do after they're confronted by Phineas and his mighty men? And there were a lot of them. <laughs> um, are they going to fight back? Are they going to explain their actions? And then we see, and I'm going to summarize this last 21 through 34, the eastern tribes talk to their accusers with grace and patience. And the two key words, grace and patience, and de-escalate the situation. What was their desire? But for the future descendants to remember all that God had done for them. And right away, when Reuben, Gad, the half-tribe of Manasseh, they reply to the heads of these other tribes, clans of Israel, they say this, the mighty one, God the Lord, the mighty one, God the Lord, he knows and let Israel know. If this has been in rebellion or disobedience to the Lord, do not spare us this day. If we have built our own altar to turn away from the Lord or to offer burnt offerings and grain offerings or to sacrifice fellowship offerings, may the Lord himself call us to account. No, we did it for fear that someday your descendants might say to ours, what have you to do with the Lord our God of Israel? In other words, it was going to be a reminder to all the tribes of what God had done. And they repeat these holy names of the Lord, admit humbly, hey, if we have done anything wrong here, may God strike us down. But we're just thinking of the future, our grandchildren's faith, our children's children, all going on to continue to worship God. And look, look at the name that they gave this altar. This wasn't an altar that was going to be competing with other place of sacrifice. It was just this huge, huge monument, but it was for this. It says, the Reubenites and the Gadites gave the altar this name, a witness between us that the Lord is God. It was meant to be this, this beautiful reminder. Look at what God has done. The Lord is God. And they go on to say, we agree, we're going to follow the one God. We're going to bring our sacrifices to the real altar. This is just a remembrance. And, uh, and, and after this, the other guys put their guns down. Everything de-escalates. And I think what we can learn from this that can apply is that one thing, first of all, relationships are hard, aren't they? Relationships have challenges. And they're beautiful. It's good. Relationships are some of the best things of life that we have, right? A uh, relationship with God, a relationship with other people. But they can be difficult, whether it's with a spouse, children, coworkers, friends. And communication can be difficult, but it's critical, especially for believers, because the, really the name and reputation of our God is on the line. How do we handle ourselves? And or do we just you know, are we wimpy and just don't bring admonition when needed? Are we bullies and just brashly make assumptions and, and accusations? And, you know, where's our, how's our, we're going to check our pride at the door. And uh, yet, continually, transformation is what God calls us to from the inside out. And without God transforming our hearts, that's what our human nature will do. We'll go to war day after day with others. 
but being people who are modeling Jesus, humble, courageous, and I want to go back to a verse from John 1, where we look at who Jesus is and is today. The Word became flesh, made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Say those two words with me, grace and truth. That's the word, Jesus, made flesh, the logos, full of grace and truth. Operated with humility, not with arrogance. He didn't avoid conflict. He told people what was needed to be heard. The, the truth of God and, and of, of sin and, and life and what, what was needed to be heard. And he modeled humility with courage. And ultimately, well, the world hated him for it. It says even his own people did not receive him but made war against him and, and put him on the cross to die as a sinner. An insurrectionist, they called him. But even Jesus, as he hung on the cross, dying, he knew the people's hearts, and what did he say? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And he breathed his last breath. He died for us, for our failure to act, for our actions that have been wrong. He died for all our sins so that we can be forgiven and rose again. And the empty cross and the empty tomb stand as a witness to that. So my prayer as we embrace the gospel that the Holy Spirit would give you and me courage, yes, to speak truth and, and humility, not to be a strong-armed bully, but to speak the truth in love. And makes us ask some questions, you know, and I'm going to leave you with this as we pray. A um, couple things. Where do assumption and accusation inevitably lead me? Yeah, am I prone to confrontation? Do I move without the facts? How might the witness of the cross and the empty tomb give me the power to handle conflicts with greater grace and truth? Look to Jesus and ask him for guidance in that and, and receive him. We, like I said, we need transformation daily or we will follow into the ways of the world. And lastly, is there anyone I need to make peace with today? All your relationships, right? And conflict comes and goes, we know but making peace with others, how vital that is as we walk as brothers and sisters in Christ.